Anticoagulation principles. Heparin, part three, low molecular weight heparin. Hi again, everybody, and welcome to the Farm Easy Tutor. In parts one and two, we talked all about unfractionated heparin. Now in part three, we move on and discuss low molecular weight heparin. Low molecular weight heparins are shorter molecular versions of unfractionated heparin. Unfractionated heparin undergoes chemical or enzymatic depolymerization to produce lower molecular weight fragments called low molecular weight heparin. These lower molecular weight fragments are approximately one third the size of unfractionated heparin. The mean molecular weight of low molecular weight heparins range from 4,000 to 5,000 Daltons. In comparison, unfractionated heparin has a mean molecular weight of 15,000 Daltons. The two most familiar low molecular weight heparins are anoxaparin or lovinox and daltaparin fragmin. From this point forward in our discussion on low molecular weight heparins, we will be referring to anoxaparin as the main low molecular weight heparin being used in practice. Low molecular weight heparins own superior pharmacokinetic properties compared to unfractionated heparin. For example, enoxaparin has a longer half-life of four to five hours that allows once daily dosing. Low molecular weight heparins frequently replace unfractionated heparin in many clinical situations because of its relative ease of dosing and monitoring the shorter sequence of these heparin fragments reduces binding to proteins or cells, which improves the variability in the anticoagulant effect. Finally, low molecular weight heparins reduced binding to platelets and PF4 results in a lower incidence of HIT. In order to understand the mechanism of action of low molecular weight heparins, Let's first review how unfractionated heparin works. In our last segment, we talked about how unfractionated heparin binds to antithrombin, forming a complex leading to a conformational surface change that activates antithrombin from a slow progressive thrombin inhibitor to a very rapid inhibitor. In the diagram, you can see this conformational change in antithrombin. Notice the small receptor size in antithrombin changing and opening up wider after it binds to heparin. The activated heparin antithrombin complex then binds to and inactivates the coagulation enzymes thrombin and factor 10A, producing an anticoagulant effect. Larger heparin molecules that are greater than 18 saccharides in size are required to inhibit thrombin. This is because the heparin antithrombin complex must completely bind to and wrap around thrombin in order to inhibit it. In contrast, smaller, shorter heparin molecules that contain the pentasaccharide sequence can easily inhibit factor 10A. Complete wraparound binding by the heparin antithrombin complex to factor 10A is less important for inhibition. Now let's go over the mechanism of action of low molecular weight heparins. Similar to unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparins produce their anticoagulant effect by first binding to antithrombin, forming a low molecular weight antithrombin complex. Antithrombin is activated and this complex then binds to and inactivates thrombin and factor 10A, which then inhibits these coagulation factors. As stated earlier, only heparin chains that contain a minimum of 18 saccharide units are of sufficient length to bridge or wrap around to inactivate thrombin. Therefore, low molecular weight heparins have reduced ability to inactivate thrombin because the smaller fragments cannot bind simultaneously to antithrombin and thrombin. Only 25 to 50% of low molecular weight heparin chains above this critical chain length 
are able to inactivate thrombin. In contrast, all low molecular weight heparin chains containing the high affinity penisaccharide can easily catalyze the inactivation of factor 10A because this reaction does not require bridging. Low molecular weight heparins have inhibitory activity against factor 10A relative to thrombin at a ratio of 3.8 to 1. Here's a list of indications for enoxaparin. Enoxaparin can be used for DVT prophylaxis, after hip replacement surgery, after hip fracture surgery, after knee replacement surgery, after abdominal surgery, and in acute medical illness with severely restricted mobility. Enoxaparin can also be used for the acute treatment of VTE, which is DVT and PE. It could also be used in the treatment of unstable angina or non-Q-wave MI and in the treatment of acute STEMI. What are the dosages for enoxaparin? First, let's talk about DVT prophylaxis. The doses are either 40 mg sub-Q every 24 hours or 30 mg sub-Q every 12 hours, depending on the indication. In renal failure, that is, if the creatinine clearance is less than 30 mL per minute, dosages must be reduced to 30 mg sub-Q daily for all DVT prophylaxis indications. Treatment doses for enoxaparin. For acute treatment of VTE, the dose is 1 mg per kilogram sub-Q every 12 hours. 1.5 mg per kilogram sub-Q every 24 hours can also be used, but this dose should be avoided in obesity, pregnancy, pediatrics, and renal impairment. For unstable angina or non-Q-wave MI, the treatment dose of enoxaparin is 1 mg per kilogram sub-Q every 12 hours. The enoxaparin treatment dose for acute STEMI depends on the age of the patient. If the patient is younger than 75 years old, a 30 mg IV bolus is first given, followed by 1 mg per kilogram sub-Q every 12 hours, with the first two doses capped at 100 mg. In order to give the enoxaparin via IV bolus, you need to use the multiple dose vial in order to prepare the dose. The dose can be diluted with saline or D5W. For patients that are 75 years or older, no bolus dose is given, just a dose of 0.75 mg per kilogram sub-Q every 12 hours, with the first two doses capped at 75 mg. In renal insufficiency, that is, if the creatinine clearance is less than 30 mL per minute, Doses for all treatment indications need to be reduced to 1 mg per kilogram sub-Q daily. For enoxaparin treatment dosages in mg per kilogram, the actual body weight should be used for dose determination up to a weight of 150 kg. For patients weighing above 150 kg, use of the adjusted body weight should be considered and or anti-10A levels be monitored. How do we monitor low molecular weight heparins? Well, no laboratory monitoring is required for the majority of patients on low molecular weight heparins. The activity of low molecular weight heparin is more predictable than unfractionated heparin. Therefore, coagulation monitoring is not generally necessary. Some clinicians do suggest that NI10A monitoring be done in obese patients, those with renal insufficiency, and when given during pregnancy. Low molecular weight heparins have significant pharmacokinetic advantages over unfractionated heparin. Reduced binding to plasma proteins is responsible for a more predictable dose anticoagulant response relationship of low molecular weight heparins. 
decreased binding to macrophages and endothelial cells increases the plasma half-life of low molecular weight heparin compared with unfractionated heparin. Let's talk about the pharmacokinetics of enoxaparin. Enoxaparin is given subcutaneously. After sub-Q injection, the bioavailability of low molecular weight heparins is about 90 to 100 percent compared to 30 to 70 percent for unfractionated heparin. Time to peak sub-Q is three to five hours. The volume distribution of enoxaparin is four to five liters, similar to the body's blood volume. The half-life of enoxaparin is three to six hours after sub-Q injection. And enoxaparin is predominantly cleared renally. It does need adjustment when creatinine clearance is less than 30 mLs per minute. What do we do when a patient overdoses on unfractionated heparin or low molecular weight heparin? Let's spend a few minutes talking about that. Protamine sulfate is the recommended antidote for reversal of heparin's anticoagulant effect. Protamine is a protein derived from fish sperm that binds to heparin, rapidly neutralizing it and making it unable to act as an anticoagulant. Neutralization of heparin occurs when the cationic protamine binds to the anionic heparin, forming a protamine heparin complex that is inactive. Protamine reversal should be limited to life-threatening or serious bleeding caused by heparin or for patients undergoing emergent surgery. First, let's talk about using protamine for unfractionated heparin overdose. Time from the administration of heparin is used to determine the initial dose of protamine needed for reversal. Remember that the half-life of heparin is 60 to 90 minutes, so with time, significant amounts of heparin may have already been degraded. One important point to remember is that every one milligram of protamine that's administered neutralizes 100 units of unfractionated heparin. Heparin neutralization should occur within five minutes of protamine administration. What should the protamine dose be? For continuous IV heparin, only the last two to three hours of heparin needs to be considered when calculating the dose for protamine. Therefore, a patient receiving a continuous IV infusion of heparin at 1,250 units per hour requires approximately 30 milligrams of protamine to neutralize the heparin that was given in the past two to two and a half hours. For sub-Q heparin, protamine may be given as a prolonged infusion. The APTT can be used to monitor the efficacy of protamine neutralization. Here are two important points to know about protamine. Use a maximum dose of 50 milligrams of protamine at a time. One needs to be careful when giving protamine as excess protamine can potentially enhance bleeding tendency. The second point is to administer protamine slowly via slow IV push no faster than 50 milligrams over 10 minutes. Administration of protamine too rapidly has been associated with hypotension, pulmonary edema, and anaphylaxis. Now let's talk about using protamine for low molecular weight heparin overdose. Protamine can only reverse 65 to 70% of anoxaparin at the most Protamine completely neutralizes thrombin that's bound to the low molecular weight antithrombin complex, but it can only variably neutralize factor 10A that's bound to the low molecular weight antithrombin complex. Also, enoxaparin must have been given within the past 8 to 12 hours in order to be reversed. Remember the half-life of enoxaparin is 3 to 6 hours. Use of protamine is not recommended if the last dose was given more than 12 hours ago. If enoxaparin was given within the last eight hours, protamine sulfate should be administered in a dose of one milligrams of protamine per 100 anti-10A units of low molecular weight heparin. One milligram of enoxaparin equals approximately 100 anti-10A units. 
a second dose of 0.5 milligrams of protamine per 100 anitene units can be administered if bleeding continues. If anoxaparin was given within the last 8 to 12 hours, smaller doses of protamine can be given, 0.5 milligrams of protamine for every 1 milligram or 100 units of low molecular weight heparin. Again, use a maximum dose of 50 milligrams of protamine at a time. And also, remember to administer the protamine slowly via IV push, no faster than 50 milligrams over 10 minutes to avoid hypotension, pulmonary edema, and anaphylaxis. In part three of this three-part series, we explain the differences between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin. We reviewed the pharmacology, kinetics, and side effects of enoxaparin. We listed enoxaparin's indications and respective dosages. And we described how to treat overdoses of unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin with protamine. We've got a lot in store at the Farm Easy Tutor channel. There will be upcoming talks on newly approved drugs, the DOAX, electrolyte management, quinolone side effects, drug overdose, and much, much more. So please stay tuned to us. Thanks for tuning in to watch this installment of the PharmEZ Tutor. I hope you learned something that you could use at school or in practice. If you'd like to continue to see more of these types of tutorials on YouTube, please make sure to click on the subscribe button below to change it from red to gray. Also, if you like this video, I would appreciate it if you can click on the thumbs up icon below to change the color to blue. If you have any comments or questions, please feel free to add them in the comment section below or share this site with someone else. Stay tuned to the Farm Easy Tutor channel for more lectures in the upcoming weeks. So until next time, remember to take it easy. Please take a moment to read the important disclaimer on the next slide.